So if following the law, which is basically what you're doing with your works, is you're just trying your best to follow the law, if that's not going to work out for me, and I'm being told that that's not enough, and I'm being told in the scriptures that it's through Christ alone, then how does all this work? Because I'm reading this in the scriptures, but it's not matching up to what I'm being taught on Sundays. I'm actually in my Lutheran church, St. Paul, St. Matthew's Lutheran Church, with my good friend Jim Roberts. Jim is also a deacon here at our church, and he is going to tell his story today about how he became a confessional Lutheran, how he went from being a Roman Catholic to a confessional Lutheran. And then we're going to be talking about some of the differences uh, between the two. So, Jim, welcome. Hi. All right. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, great. So, uh... It, and by the way, if you hear some echo, that's because that's because of the church. Usually that's uh, not in the video, but you'll probably hear some echo uh, when you watch this video. Sorry about that. We did the best we could do there. So, Jim, we're going to be talking about the differences as well mm -hmm. between uh, Roman Catholicism and confessional Lutheranism. So a lot of people that watch these videos don't know what a confessional Lutheran is. Did you know what a Lutheran was before you became a Lutheran? Or I guess to ask it another way, what did you think of Lutherans when you were a Roman Catholic? So when I was a Roman Catholic, it's not something that was uh, glossed over by any means. I was raised in a Catholic church, went to Catholic school, and I had a family that was Roman Catholic, still is, um, in practicing Roman Catholic, yeah. not just what we would call uh, traditionally Catholic mm -hmm. or culturally Catholic, yep. like you see with a lot of people of faith. And the understanding that we had, or at least that I was brought up with for the Lutheran Church, was there's Catholic, Orthodox, and then pretty much everybody else falls under the term Protestant. So there was no clear distinction between Lutherans, Baptist, Anabaptist, it was Catholic or Protestant. So, yeah, that was about it. Okay. As far as what my original understanding of Lutheranism was. Okay. Well, we are confessional Lutherans. That's mm -hmm. what we are. And there's a big difference between a confessional Lutheran and, uh, uh, you know, someone from the ELCA. So we probably should give a brief definition of a conf confessional Lutheran. Uh, because a lot of people would think that if you're a Lutheran, well, you believe in gay marriage, maybe. You believe in abortion rights. You believe in women pastors. We are confessional conservative. We do not believe in, uh, in those things. Let me just read a definition from the Book of Concord. And by the way, a confessional Lutheran, and I brought this with me from home, but I've got a, a digital copy here. This is the Book of Concord, okay? It is the uh, Lutheran Confessions. And this is what we as Lutherans hold to. We hold to the Book of Concord. Um, and this is what uh, uh, this little definition of a confessional Lutheran uh, is uh, in the Book of Concord. This is what it says. Historic, genuine Lutheranism holds that the Bible is actually the word of the living God. We believe that it is both incapable of error and free from error. We hold strongly to the Lutheran confessions because we are absolutely convinced that these confessions of faith are a pure exposition and explanation of God's word. Lutherans agree with the Apostle Peter, who said, We cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Acts 4.20 when God the Holy Spirit gives the gift of trust in Jesus Christ as the Savior, this gift of faith creates a desire to confess, to bear witness, to testify, to proclaim, and to speak this faith. That is what the documents in this book are all about. They are not musty old relics from history. They are the living confession of God's people who have clung to the truths in these documents for nearly 500 years. Today, we who hold to these confessions make the Book of Concord our confession, our witness, our public testimony of what the Bible teaches. With Martin Luther, we say, here we stand, we can do no other. So they're not saying, you know, that the Book of Concord is equal to Scripture or anything like that, but it is a, uh, a good um, 
uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, 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 it's in line with the Bible. It, it goes, uh, it, there's nothing in there that contradicts scripture or that's going to try to add to scripture or that's going to, you know, Melanchthon or none of the, uh, writers of the formula Concord, they would, none of them would have ever said that these confessions are right there on par with scripture as far as being, you know, equal to scripture. Right. So confessional Lutheran is a lot different than what a lot of people think that a Lutheran is. Uh, because I went before I was uh, a Lutheran, that's what I thought a Lutheran was. A Lutheran was somebody that was just this, uh, they were just liberal, you know, they, they believed in all kinds of things. And I, I knew there were some conservative Lutherans, but, um, uh, the general idea of a Lutheran, that's kind of what was in my mind. When I was studying Lutheranism uh, a little bit more seriously, the word confession and confessional Lutheranism kind of scared me a little bit um, because I kind of had this idea and like I was a little taken back by Am I trying to say that this book, like, what's the level of importance here? And once I was actually reading over the, the confessions, then I can mm -hmm. see, like, okay, this falls exactly in line. And again, it's yeah. not adding, it's not taking yep. away, it's not, you know, sussing out what's relevant yeah. uh, just to us in this current day as opposed to now. We're basically reading scripture as it is, and we're just going to accept it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Jim, tell us your story. Tell us, uh, you know, let's start when, you know, you, you grew up in a Catholic home mm -hmm. um, and you certainly were, a, you know, were you a devout Catholic? Yeah, I would say so. Okay. All right. So you went to uh, service every Every, every Sunday. Every Sunday. Okay. And your family is still practicing uh, yep, Roman Catholics. All right. So, so talk about uh, your journey. How, how did you come from Roman Catholicism to Lutheranism? So being in a religious family and having that upbringing, you know, our father at night, that's the Lord's prayer, mm -hmm. going to a Catholic school, going to church on Sundays, it was always there. You know, as a uh, as a kid, I wasn't uh, questioning. I didn't need uh, like explanations for things. I just I believed in God. It just it yeah. made sense, yeah. uh, even as a little kid. And uh, even as a kid, I would pray. And so I started off in a Catholic school. Um, went to two Catholic schools. I was brought to church every Sunday, and my godmother took her role very seriously in, a, in the very <laughs> traditional sense of a godparent. You know, this isn't just somebody, you know, in case my parents would ever pass away that would, you know, take the, the burden of another kid. She would drag me by my ear sometimes to church, <laughs> especially as a teenager, like literally would walk into my house and then pull me by my ear. <laughs> <laughs> so that you're not, you're not talking that that's not uh, that's not a figure of speech that, that she actually did that. She literally walked into your house yes. as a teenager when you weren't going to go to church right. and she grabbed you by the ear and yes. said, you're going. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So yeah, she took her role extremely seriously and I, I'm thankful for that. Mm. Um, now, as I got a little bit older, I ended up going through uh, my confirmation class. I did pretty well in my religious studies on that. And at the end of confirmation class, uh, one of the things that you're supposed to do is you need to write a letter to the bishop, basically explaining why you want to be confirmed. Now at that point, I had already read enough into scripture that some of the questions that I wasn't quite getting answered or weren't matching up to what I was reading in scripture. So talk about that for a minute. How, how, what, what, what got you into the Bible? What was it that caused you to crack open a Bible and to start reading it? So even before confirmation class, I'd periodically just pop open the Bible and I would read it. Um, at the time it would be an NSRV mm -hmm. was, would be the Bibles we had in our house. Um, as I went through my confirmation classes, I found myself reading it more and more and not just what my specific readings were supposed to be. Mm. And once I started reading things in context and that, not just passages, yeah. that's what really got the wheels turning. And that's something that we talk about all the time. It, it, what changes a lot of people is the fact that they're not just reading a, a, a you know the, a piece of scripture that they've been taught or or say a person's in church and they're listening to their pastor and their pastor's got one verse on the screen and then he's got this whole sermon that's not even right. related to that verse they and they look down at their bible and went, wait a minute that's not what what this 
what that verse is talking about. That's kind of what happened with you. You, you began to look at scripture uh, in its context. Once I, I moved away from my only real exposure to scripture being something like that, where we have a couple verses, there's some readings from scripture, and then I'm going to hear, you know, half an hour sermon explaining how is that applicable to me today and what should I do with my life based upon that reading. When I moved away from only having that to also reading scripture, as in from cover to cover, you, you get the bigger story. And yeah. the bigger story and really the main story is Christ from yeah. the very beginning to the end. Yeah. It's, it's everything is pointing towards Christ. Mm -hmm. And once you start seeing everything pointing towards Christ, every piece of scripture, it's like, uh, it's like you have these Jesus tinted glasses yeah. and you start seeing Christ everywhere. And mm -hmm. when, when everything's pointing towards Christ, you see other things fall away. You see other things fall away in their importance. You see other things fall away as far as like what's my place mm -hmm. in this big picture of things. Yep. And you end up seeing uh, Christ crucified on the cross for our salvation. Right. In all things. Yeah, yeah. So you started reading scripture, mm -hmm. and when you started reading the Bible, you began to read things in context. What happened next? I was becoming Lutheran without knowing what Lutheran was. <laughs> so to me, there was no difference in the way I was raised between uh, confessional Lutheran and non-denominational churches or Baptist churches. It's just, that was a different box. Mm. And uh, we would, as Romans, or at least in my family, uh, we, you'd hear the term holy rollers, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, that was the box that everybody else was in. It was Including Lutherans. Including Lutherans, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, zero distinction whatsoever yeah. with my understanding between Lutherans and any other Protestant church. Yeah. But a lot of the same things that Martin Luther was uh, discussing and kind of uh, were, were irking at Luther about the state of the church, those same things were coming up for me without knowing the whole backstory of Lutheranism and all of his writings. Yeah, let me let me ask you this. Um, now, Luther had, of course, that um, constant conviction uh, of sin. Constantly, when he was a monk, he would uh, he would go to the confessional and he would confess his sins to yep. the to the priest, and um, he would feel good and he would leave. And on his way back, he would remember something yeah. and he would go back to the confessional and he would confess and he never had peace. It wasn't until what, what's called his tower experience where he was studying Romans chapter one, verse 16, uh, where all of a sudden it, it says that the scriptures came alive to him and it f felt as if he entered into the gates of heaven because he realized that the righteousness in that verse where it says, um, uh, uh, the right, the righteous will live by faith or the just will live by faith was talking about an imputed righteousness, a righteousness right. that was given to us as a gift rather than our own righteousness, which he thought it always talked about. So, but before that, he was just in constant agony and he would do, you know, his confessors would get so irritated with his confessor, uh, would get so irritated with him because he would come back all the time <laughs> to the confessional. Constantly worried about yeah. damnation, constantly worried about hell. You're saying that's you. That was me. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And sort of a, like a, a very general understanding mm -hmm. that I had of salvation was because of Christ crucified, because of God coming to us, having Jesus live, die on a cross, even though he did not need to, right? Mm -hmm. Even though uh, it could have uh, not been an event, but it was, it was something God did for us. Mm -hmm. Came back from the dead, like that element of salvation, the, the understanding that that's what it's really all about in my faith in Christ. Uh, when I was Roman, my understanding, when I was Roman Catholic was because of that, I have the opportunity to be mm. saved, right? It was about mm -hmm. having the opportunity to be yeah. saved. So I kind of think of it as if you have hell over here, let's, let's yeah. say you have hell over here yeah. and you have heaven over here yeah. and here's my life, right? So yeah. far left hell, far right heaven. I get to, because of my belief in Christ, I get to start here in the middle. Now, based upon my own actions every single day, every minute, I'm either going a little bit one way or a little bit the other way. Mm. And not knowing, okay, 
have I put enough jelly beans in the going to heaven <laughs> jar without knowing if I had enough beans in the, in the going to heaven jar uh, with my, my works was always bothering me. That yeah. was always a frustration. And something that I felt that that ended up doing for me was uh, a lot of my thoughts and my prayer life, I noticed were all very inward. Um, mm. They were about me focused on what can I do to avoid sin? What can I do to essentially earn my salvation, right? I was given the right for salvation, yeah. but I still felt the burden was on me and what I'm doing and my very flawed person that I am, as we all are. And that was a, a constant struggle. So you understood that Christ died for you, for the sins of the world, but yet you at the same time, like you said, you were, you were trying to almost work your way to make sure you were going to get there. To, to, right. you, you, you start with a clean slate almost, and then you have to kind of make sure that your, your, uh, your, uh, your works are leaning towards that, uh, the road to heaven, so to speak. Right. And sure, good works for taking care of other people, good mm -hmm. works for helping the community, things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, you know, the anointing of the sick, we can get into sacraments later. Um, yeah, that would be some of these good works that you could do. But at the same time, a lot of your bandwidth, or at least for me, a lot of my bandwidth of my, my thinking and my prayers, it was focused on me. Yeah. It was focused on what can I do for me to get myself, yeah. you know, that winning seat at the end. Yeah. So it wasn't about Christ has already done all the work. You hadn't come to that point yet where you saw that Christ has done all the work for us, mm -hmm. that his righteousness is given to us as a gift, that Christ has reconciled the world, God reconciled the world to himself in Christ, and that you were forgiven. Your sins are forgiven, and you know you hadn't come to that realization. When did that take place? When did you actually move from, man, this is killing me, to, oh, I've got peace, I've got Christ, I've got his righteousness, I, I've got everything that I need. When did that start? Uh, when did that come? So as I was reading through scripture, I was seeing more and more of that message mm -hmm. that it's not about my works. The yeah. work's already been done and it wasn't mm -hmm. me. You know, I, I'm nothing but an ant in this universe. I, I'm less than a <laughs> grain of sand. And to think that something as monumental as eternal life and my salvation is something that I'm going to work myself out of. Well, as I'm reading the New Testament now with my better understanding of the Old Testament, which is not really, for me, wasn't touched on much mm -hmm. in the church. Well, everything that I'm seeing in the New Testament about the old sacrificial systems and how in really the end, that's, you're, you're not going to follow the law perfectly. Right. That's yeah. not going to happen. So if following the law, which is basically what you're doing with your works is you're just trying your best to follow the law. If that's not going to work out for me, and I'm being told that that's not enough, and I'm being told in the scriptures that it's through Christ alone, then how does all this work? Because I'm reading this in the scriptures, but it's not matching up to what I'm being taught on Sundays. Mm -hmm. So maybe they didn't quite have all the answers. You know, it wasn't matching up to what I was reading in scripture. So you wrote a letter to your... well. So, so I, I don't want to jump ahead of, yeah, the, of yeah. the story. So, so where does this play in as far as your confirmation classes oh, go? Yeah. So, so, so go back to there. So I, I, I finished confirmation class. Mm -hmm. At the end of confirmation class, you write a letter to the bishop. Yeah. And your letter basically is, why do you want to be confirmed? Right? It's not so much uh, like a test to show me what you learned. It's just, why do you want to be confirmed? Right. And in my letter... I stated that I didn't want to be confirmed. And <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. So you, you literally, as a Roman Catholic, growing up a Roman Catholic your entire life, you literally in that letter said, I don't want to be confirmed. How old were you at the time, if you don't mind oh, me asking? I don't remember. Okay. But, okay, so you told, you told the bishop in the letter that you don't want to be confirmed. Yep. Now, whether or not that got delivered, I don't know. Okay. Um, so, but then I stated my reasons. Mm-hmm. And thinking back about it now, and I'm sure I'm foggy on details, but it seems like a lot of my reasons that I was listing matched up to Martin Luther's thesis. <laughs> and uh. and uh, so I stated, uh, here's the questions that I had that don't have answers. Uh, here's where I see things that are not falling in line with scripture that I'm being taught by the faith. And 
let me take some time to look into this a little bit further. And basically it was, I'll get back to you. So um, now let's go from there to your family. Did you, how did you break that news that you weren't going to be confirmed to your family? Oh, that was really hard. It yeah. was, it was very difficult and I'm sure it was horribly embarrassing to my family mm -hmm. and I do feel bad about that. Yeah. Um, it was also weird too, because when you're confirmed, people have parties and stuff like that and it's yeah. a whole big thing and they're like, oh, but he didn't get confirmed. So, right, so right. you just kind of, so like the, like that was kind of missed. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, that was hard. It was, they, uh, didn't quite fully accept it, but at the same time, uh, some of my family that was a little bit more religious than others, I think were more understanding okay. than the folks that I, I would say are slightly more culturally Catholic. You okay. know, they have faith, but they're not as gung ho and excited about it. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So now you're kind of, all right, no, so I'm not going to be, a, I'm not going to be a Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be confirmed. What am I going to do? What, uh, what am I going to, what, 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 what church am I going to go to? You Where go am I going? Shopping. Yeah. yeah. That's what you do. You go church shopping. <laughs> so did you go, so, so talk about your, uh, talk about your church shopping experiences. So with seeing so many differences between what I was being taught by the church, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say like capital T H E the church. Right. And having it ingrained in me that any other Christian denomination or any other Christian faith isn't the church. It's not the church that was established by Christ uh, through Peter. <laughs> and right. so therefore null and void. If this doesn't match up, it's null and void. That was my understanding. Now, I ended up uh, going to a lot of different churches. I even checked out and, and looked into other faiths. Um, really? Yeah. Uh, what other faiths did you, uh, did you look into? Uh, Buddhism. Did you? Mahayana. Wow. Hinyana. Wow. Yep. Um, I saw, I went to a service for a uh, Mahayana service. I uh, checked out, um, let's see, Methodist churches. Uh, I looked into non-denominational churches. I attended a reformed church. Okay. So, so, all right. So let's go back to the scripture thing. So, so you were, you were digging in the scriptures, you were, um, seeing Christ in the scriptures. Was there, was there some sort of doubt or something, uh, after all of that, that caused you to look into Buddhism? Yeah. I think the, if I'm going to accept the Roman church as being the absolute authority over mm -hmm. scripture, if it doesn't quite match up, if it's not seeming to be accurate, if I'm seeing fallacies in that understanding of, of all of Scripture, mm -hmm. then that kind of makes you doubt Scripture and yeah. the veracity of Scripture mm. um, when you're being preached something that's not quite matching up. Right, right. And so that was like the experience that kind of burned me. And I mm. was trying to see what else is going on out there. So what, uh, all right, so, so what, before you came into uh, a Lutheran church, were you pretty much settled that, okay, Buddhism isn't it. God's word is God's word. And I'm just going to uh, accept what it says. And I'm going to find a church if it kills me kind of attitude. Well, Did you have so, that kind of so attitude? So here's the thing with, with like church shopping, right? Yeah. So even with having this uh, sort of like mental understanding of, okay, in my head, I'm thinking, here's the absolute authority on Christianity. Mm -hmm. That's not matching up. So does that mean that that's null and void? I'm leaning on that. In some way I can't explain, as hard as I tried to run away from my faith mm -hmm. in Christ, it just, it was like laughable to me. What do you mean? Oh, running away was laughable to you. Yeah, like, like uh, it, it, I could see the way other people uh, would think about things in different religions and different faiths. And I can't explain it, but like, I still just 100% knew as much as I would try to talk myself out of it with philosophy and yeah. anything else, uh, I just 100% knew like, no, Christ was real. Christ yeah. died, Christ rose. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, I, you can't run. So now you're looking for a church, mm -hmm. you're, you're church hopping. Now you um, are thinking, okay, I, I, I haven't, it's not in Buddhism. It's not in non-denominationalism. 
was there another branch of Christianity or another denomination that you were leaning towards yeah, before the, Lutheranism? Yeah. What were, what was that? The, the, the Reformed Church came close. Yeah, they came yeah. close. So after accepting and, and just okay, yeah, no, Christ is real. Christ dies. Christ rose. Yeah. After just accepting what I already knew to be true, I then say, okay. Well, let me look at some Christian denominations in a little bit more detail. What are these things that I'm reading in scripture that either the Roman church, when I talk to priests, aren't really able to answer, or for whatever reason, I can't find exact answers on, or they're just not matching up. So I have a little checklist. So here's some things that uh, I know to be true. I know my salvation is through Christ alone. Yep. Check one. Yep. Right? Yep. Um, I know that the Eucharist is true body, true blood. Yep. It just says it. Yep. Right? Um, the Bible is true. It's factual and it's infallible. Mm -hmm. I knew this. Yep. And this is right in scripture and this is the way I'm reading it. So as I'm working through this checklist, a lot of these faiths, a lot of these denominations, they kind of fall away. You know, I... You know, but why do you believe something separate from scripture? Why do you believe something different from what it plainly says in the text? Right, right. And with the reformed church, started checking all the boxes. I'm like, okay, you're on the line. Okay, this, this makes sense. Tulip, okay, so I was going into that. It's, it's a little weird, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you're talking about reformed theology. Yes, you're yep, okay, yep. yep. And uh, when it came down to uh, the, the true presence, That's, like, that okay. was the deal breaker. I'm like, but if he said it's my body and my blood, yeah. why would it not be? That right. doesn't make sense. Right, right. Like, so, all right, we'll get to the sacraments um, uh, shortly, but let's, uh, so, so we'll kind of put that on the back burner mm -hmm. for just a few moments. Now talk about, okay, so I'm getting close to uh, reform theology. I'm getting re close to, um, was it Presbyterian that you had, that you had gone to or actually a reform or a reformed church or was it reformed, reformed church? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so it wasn't reformed Baptist. It wasn't reformed no. Presbyterian. It was a reformed church. Okay. Like, gotcha. Reformed church. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what was it that made you say, okay, I'm not sure about this, uh, about the Reformed Church. Let me check Luth the Lutheran Church and see. What, 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 what was Luth was the, well, let me ask it this way. Was the Lutheran Church your last choice? No, no. no? So the Lutheran okay. Church wasn't my last choice, but if we go back to those differences between the various Lutheran churches, right? The mm -hmm. churches that consider themselves and call themselves, advertise themselves as Lutheran. Yeah. The majority is the ELCA. Exactly. Exactly. And from yep. what I'm reading on the ELCA, from their websites, from uh, only a couple times attending uh, their churches, yep. um, I wasn't seeing any real difference between the ELCA and some of the more progressive, uh, like non-denominational churches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wasn't seeing any difference between them um, and, uh, let's say, like the Methodist, even, and, and sort of this. We're going to kind of brush to the side uh, some of these things in Scripture that people grapple with, and really it's all about coming together. But instead mm. of coming together and saying we accept Scripture for what it is, it's let's come together and say, like, the parts you don't like, we're just going to kind of say, you know, that's a cultural thing. It was specific to the time yeah. in all cases. Yeah. Right? yeah. As, opposed to, as opposed to, okay, read Scripture in context. Was this a letter to a particular church? Not even in that detail, but, like, let's just say if this makes you uncomfortable, we're going to say... It's not a big deal. And so that was my understanding of Lutheran Church. It was just another one of those churches. Yeah, yeah. So how did you find uh, a confessional? And, and it, I guess I could, I, I'm trying to ask it the right way because, so how did you end up going to a confessional yeah, Lutheran so, Church? So going through doctrine, I said, okay, well, let me try to hear some people speak. Let me, let me, let's, let's hear what the, the, what the pastors say from these different faiths, as opposed to just reading, you know, what is your official statement, you know, on their websites and PDFs mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And so I started uh, checking out some, some of these uh, pastors for the Lutheran churches. And so you go on YouTube, right? And you yeah. dig in Lutheran. Okay. And then I see, 
all these folks that say Lutheran, and then all of a sudden I, I see some that pop up and some things that say LCMS, and I'm like, oh, that's confusing. And I already knew there were different denominations in Lutheran. Um, I didn't really get into seven X. I won't get go different synods. Different, in, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, but I figured they were all pretty much just the same. Right. And uh, so then when I started digging more into, wow, I, there's like a lot of breakaways in the the LCMS. What's yeah. up? Or in the Lutheran Church? What's up with that? So I started taking a look at. Well, I wonder what some of these smaller Lutheran churches are. Right. Let's yeah. let's take a look at some of those. Let's watch some of their videos for pastors. And then I ended up coming across uh, Fisk. And, yeah, and, yeah, Jonathan Fisk. Yep, and, uh, and Cooper. Jordan Cooper, yep. yep. Um, and Wolf Mueller. Wolf Mueller. I was watching yeah. Wolf Mueller this morning. <laughs> yep. And, yeah, uh, yeah I, I'd say those guys had a, a huge influence in me looking at the LCMS in particular. Yeah. Now, um, so when you, uh, so, so it was St. Paul's the first uh, uh, confessional Lutheran church that, which is our, we're, we're actually now St. Paul's St. Matthew's because St. Matthew's joined mm-hmm. us. But before we were St. Paul's, it, is that it was, the, it was first the first Missouri you, Synod okay. Lutheran church that I no, went to? Yep. Okay. All right. Very good. It was the first Missouri Synod church. And as soon as I walked in the doors and I, it's you know the building doesn't necessarily need to look or feel a certain way for it to be right mm-hmm. right it's mm-hmm. all about the word and the preaching of the word yeah. it's about us coming together it's so the building doesn't matter but I gotta say like when I came into the building it felt like a church yeah which yeah. was a great start it, yeah yeah man that's 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 exactly how I felt when I first started uh, visiting a Lutheran church you know it seems like because uh, the churches I'd gone to in the past and especially um, uh, the last church my wife and I were at it was like almost like a uh, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. The, the worship, the, you know, worship music was like a concert and there were, you know, they started having the lights dimmed and you were kind of, and, and, and there wasn't a huge amount of focus on context and scripture. I, I'm, I'm right there with you. I know exactly what yeah, you were talking so about. So after, uh, attending a non-denominational church and I'm not saying they're all the same, but, mm-hmm. uh, I felt like there was a, a much greater focus on the, emotion that was trying to be evoked from you during the service yeah as opposed to the sacrament and the scripture Mm. it was more about what can we do to make you feel with our outward means right through music through lights you got a oh you got a smoke machine sure what can we do to try to evoke the sense of like elation the same as you would get at a concert so that way you truly feel the presence of god yeah it was about to me it was it was what can what can we pull from you well like what can we how can we get you to feel this presence of god with all these outward things as opposed to scripture Mm mm-hmm yeah 